distances can. And we're quite shocked to find out we were almost walking distance from each other's offices and weren't familiar with each other. So it's, it's you know, surprising how small a world it can be. And this presentation really is the, the journey that we've taken over the last year and a half to solve one of the hardest problems out there right now, which is really compelling next generation user interfaces and how to do that in a replicable, in a replicable fashion. So before I hand it to Gabor, I'll kind of cover some of also where UIs are going and how we did some of these things. Um, I want to preface this. We're, we're in a hundred year evolution of the UI. This is not a small problem. This is not something that's just, hey, it's kind of needing these mobile phones and they've, they've kind of changed the way I, I relate with technology. This is a, a big deal. Um, a, a lot of people here, I'm sure, have, have worked in a command line console. That was designed in the 1950s, replaced the punch cards. That lasted for 30 years, more than that, 50 years. And it was very codified, very strict, and it really limited people's ability to interact with technology. If you, you, know, you were a geek if you were using technology back in those days. Then it came along the GUI. We all know that. Um, technically called win Windows, Icon, uh, Menus, and Pointer, which defines Windows 95, Mac. Those are all fall into that category. And that came out in, the, in 1980, and that enabled a whole new class, a whole new generation of people to, to embrace and use technology. It was very metaphorical, and it was very explorative, and you could find things. Then it came along around 2010, what everyone knew was different. You've got an iPhone, you've got some of these touch, touch devices, and you knew what it was very different. I think what we're calling these are the natural user interfaces. There's a lot of different words being tossed out there. Um, I think Nui makes a good, good example. And these are some very complex to build. It was hard to build good GUIs. It's even harder to build really compelling into um, natural user interfaces. And so I want to kind of pass it to, to Gabor, and I want him to talk a little more about that. Thank you. Uh, so we have entered what we call the era of the intimate UI. And why do we call it that? Well, uh, in this journey, hey, Sean White. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in this journey, this evolution that we're that we're going through, I really believe it's it's a cultural evolution, but it's um, it's part of human nature to want to have intimate control over our data, over our information, over the things that we find interesting. And we find right now we're putting all of our data onto the cloud. The cloud is taking off. Uh, Apple has just announced or about to announce uh, iCloud. Um, they're getting into the cloud game big. And, and why? Well, the more we move our data, our, ourselves, into the cloud, um, the more uh, we can overlay that data with, with other information, the more we can match it together with other people's data, the more my data uh, becomes more meaningful to me because it plays with the, the, the same uh, technology in the same realm as everybody else's data. So we have all this data floating in the cloud. Um, and, and it's enabled ourselves to, to uh, see it in many different ways. And, and we're doing that through an intimate UI, being able to touch the data. It's the touch revolution. Now, um, if you, smartphones, as we've heard this morning, are, are really taking off. In North America, they're incredibly popular. Why? Um, the technology has always been there. It's been there for a while. But the, app, the touch is nothing new, but it's that multi-touch, real, natural interaction with the data that, that has made the difference. But what we find right now is we still have radically different experiences. As a UI uh, designer, as a user experience designer, I want to look at where are we going? What's that 20-year vision? And where, what I see happening is this is a problem that we're on our way to solve is that we all have radically different experiences on our lives, all devices. So what we believe is that we're going to see a, a world where devices can learn you. And not only are, are you going to be embedded in the cloud as your data is, you're going to be embedded in your interfaces. And your interfaces will share your own information so that as you go from device to device, it's your own intimate interaction with your data that carries with you. So it's interfaces that are personal, they're adaptive, they're pervasive, they're everywhere. And this future, where's it gonna come from? It's gonna come from our devices. 
We love our devices, right? Um, uh, smartphone explosion, people, the tablets the are coming problem is that our devices right now, they're silos. They are a bunch of different user experiences. But if you really look closely at devices, they all share a few things in common. They have an input layer, which right now is glass, um, but it could be auditory, it could be touchless gestures. Um, and they have a hardware layer that connects you to the cloud, that connects you to your data in the cloud. And in between, it's a device, it's the, the lens that, uh, that carries the, the, the specific functionality of the hardware um, uh, to give you the ability of that one specific view into the cloud. But really, what, the way we see it is there's this embedded layer. And what that embedded layer is, is the user experience. It's how the, inter the interface layer reflects you, reflects a, a, a vision of you, uh, a vision of, of learning your, um, your, your interaction models. And then the, the hardware reflects a, a vision of the cloud through the lens of what the hardware can do. For example, if it's a camera, it will reflect um, all of the camera-specific abilities of the cloud. And in between, where the human merges with the cloud is that embedded layer. And if you look at it that way, then really devices are not silos. They're part of an embedded ecosystem. And devices will be part of an embedded ecosystem. They will all share this embedded layer, and that embedded layer will bleed across all devices and connect them together. We're already seeing this happen. So the most important part of this embedded ecosystem is the user experience. That's what sets you aside. That's what lets you fall in love with your devices. And it's what, um, it, it's what drives the adoption of the devices themselves. For example, vehicles. This is the first time that the, the information stack in a vehicle has this embedded layer. It has an interface that is a natural UI that has intimate control over the data. And it is connected to our data in the cloud. For the first time, you can do this in your car. And for the first time, the infotainment stack in the car, the car stereo, essentially, is influencing purchase decisions. People are buying cars based on the stereo that's in them now. That's a big shift in the way they look at vehicles. This is a home automation application created by a company. Um, home automation is a big space we're getting into. Home automation, the technology behind home automation has been around for a long time. You've been able to adjust your temperature and your lights, but it hasn't really taken off as an industry, and it's about to explode. Why? Because they've adopted an embedded layer. We're bringing that to home automation. Here's another example that we created for uh, QNX. It's a at-a-glance view of your home. Here I can tell that in my basement it's 19 degrees. My main floor is 21 degrees. I'm Canadian, I like it cold. Um, upstairs, it's 23 degrees. Um, and the, the main floor is being heated. There's many different interfaces for this. I can control my lights through it. I can see my, uh, my energy usage compared to my neighbors. The, the key here, though, is that it's done in a way in which I want it in my, on, on my wall or I want it on a device sitting How do you do a table? How do you put together a team that creates interfaces that people love, that are intimate, that, that give you intimate control over your data? Here's one product. This is the BlackBerry Playbook. Here it is right now. Here's the big demo that they always show. It's a uh, HD video, and now it's video running and multitasking. Our company designed this, uh, this interface. We spent uh, most of a year at RIM, embedded with their team, and we created the, the BlackBerry Tablet OS. Uh, this, I believe, is, is probably one of the best tablets uh, available. And, of course, I'm slightly biased, but the hardware is incredible. A really, really good chip. Um, the, the kernel of the OS is the QNX OS. It's sort of one of the most stable in the market. Um, but I'm not satisfied with it. Now, why am I not satisfied with it? As the designer, it's not all it could be. 
I know what this can do, and it's not doing everything that it can do. And I'm the guy who designed it. Why? It's because our team was not uh, able to execute on our ideas fast enough. We believe in an iterative UI uh, process, but iterative design has to be done on the hardware. It can't be done in emulation. And we spent most of our time trying out ideas on emulation. Your team needs to be able to come up with ideas, put them in the hands of users, and try them out as fast as possible. And that means not doing it in software. I need to come up with an idea on a Monday and see it on hardware on a Friday so that I could take it home on the weekend and try it out to find out whether it works or not. Because really, we're, uh, it's a creative process, and half the way through it, we're inventing things. We weren't able to do that. We had to do everything in emulation. So that's really why we partnered with UI Labs, because they have the ability, and the team, to enable us, as designers, to execute on our visions right away. And really, this is what needs to be done in this area of the Intimate UI. So, unfortunately, what that meant is the last 30 years of the smartest people on the planet building the best UIs, it didn't work. But that methodology, and if any of you are, in, are, are entrenched in it, it's 3,000 page PDFs, it's document everything, lay out every pixel, be aware of how it should be, what size every button should be, all irrelevant now. Does it feel natural? Does it feel good? Does it work fast enough? That's what matters now. The size of the button, the fact that it might need to be a little bit like this isn't the important thing. So, so getting it on the device faster, doing iterations, having creative accidents that are good, that's what has to happen now. So having products and tools that let you do that is critical. And Flash allowed people to do a lot of it. You could do it on the desktop, but it didn't allow you to get to the device. And, and you know, having been in this business, we've seen so many great ideas on paper that don't make it to the device. And so this is something we've worked with um, in, in, in quite detail, with how you iterate that design, how you get it done. And so what we did is we, we developed uh, two pieces of product. One, one we acquired, which is um, the intelligent software GPU that, that's really fast. I mean, there's a lot of complexity down at the level of the hardware. That's the part that we work with on the hardware manufacturers like TI and Atmel and a lot of other hardware manufacturers to make sure we maximize that hardware to get that performance, because it's about frames per second. And we built another product called USwish from the ground up in this post-iPhone era. Um, statistically about 10 times faster than most. And in fairness, it didn't matter before. Almost every UI prior to the iPhone they didn't care. I mean, you press a button, uh, it takes a five, six seconds to load the next page, who cares? Now when you swish the screen, it needs to move 30 frames a second, very fluid, far more than you expect out of your PC, yet they're mobile devices. So it's created a huge rift there. Um, so what we did is we, we built that up, it's cross-platform, it has 2D and 3D rendering in it, um, even desktops now aren't doing 3D UI. So think about the exponential complexity that we've put on mobile devices that don't apply to desktops. Um, we also created um, the ISGPU, which allows for that operating system independence and the performance. Now I want to show you a video that kind of shows some of this, what do we mean by this? So this is a, a set of UIs. Um, we have a partnership with a company that owns 35% of the camera market. In November, this is going to launch. You, all the little point shoots I see everyone using here, this is the kind of UIs you're going to be getting on those devices in the future. And everything moves, animates. There's a lot of natural effects to it. Everything bounces. This is a, a, a table stakes now on every device. So you can't use existing tools that require dual core and gigahertz CPUs to get that. That has to be done on uh, regular hardware. This is showcasing some 3D tools. Again, this is running on fairly average bill of materials. Um, here's a sample of a photo viewer in a 3D environment on a cube. And we're getting about 60 frames a second on your typical uh, smartphone, not even the super smartphone levels that we were talking about. Um, this will be an interface for movies if you want to take a look at movies. And then this is about a 400 megahertz pre-production device, and it's showcasing some, uh, some 3D uh, animations and some 2D. And again, getting very great frame rates. This is a, a requirement. You have to be 30 frames a second. Everything has to be done quickly. Um, we talked a bit about, uh, some people have talked about uh, 3D and, and stereoscopic 3D, so there's some interesting research there. And we're showing touching the screen there, but of course, you can't often touch the screen, so there's different interfaces. This is a cute one. Our engineers had fun with this. They said, well, you know, 
if the iPhone is the, the bar, what work can we do? Uh, how low can we go? And that was a very important question. Thank you. Now let's move on to the next session. The next session we have Mr. Luca Di Fiori, the senior 